in Jesus' last week, he did miraculous things. He taught us a lot. And sometimes he brought to attention the things that were of concern. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this wonderful, wonderful gospel that you give us, which is eternal, which is life, and helps sustain us. Sustain us through the years and through the generations that allows you to continue building your church as well as advancing your kingdom for your glory through what your son did this week so, so many years ago, over 2,000 years ago. Going to the cross, fulfilling what you had called him to do so that through his blood shed on the cross we may be saved. If we choose to turn to you, seek you, and walk with you. So we pray that this message touches the eyes, the ears, and the hearts, as well as the spirits of every single believer, so that they may receive your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jesus was entering again into Jerusalem and as we spoke of uh, yesterday, there was a discussion regarding the, the fig tree that was withered. And I'll just recap on uh, this verse, which is taken from Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 to 20, or 19, should I say. In, and now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. So as mentioned, the fig tree is a, something that brings fruit, brings life. And the first fruit that's formed are the, are, uh, is, is the fruit itself and then the leaves that appear that one would expect to fi find satisfying fruit on a tree. But it's also here shown to designate the condition of Israel in this time and the religious uh, system as well as the um, heritage that appeared to hold promise and satisfaction. The, the fig tree that was cursed was not only the tree itself, but was made reference to the actions of the nation of Israel. The enacted parable showing the judgment that was to come upon Israel's false profession with faith in God, but they rejected the Son of God. But we're going to have a look at the lesson of the withered fig tree and what it teaches us. And when they're taken from verses 20, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. So appreciating that uh, this lesson was there to um, teach us and guide us and instruct us of uh, the positive uh, lesson that comes out of it. That can be learned from the withered uh, fig tree. It's that incredible, powerful opportunity for believing prayer, authoritatively spoken in accordance with God's will and purpose. This is the lesson of the withered fig tree, showing the importance of prayer and intercession. There's a lot going on in this world at this current time, whether it's local, national or global. But where it says where my people will humble themselves and come to me, and return from their ways and repent, I will heal their land. We do so, whether it's behind closed doors or whether it's in a group of believers or families or communities or even nations. I quickly reflect on a prayer drive that was done when um, 2016, I think it was. I'm not sure what, what the reason was, but I just recall seeing on, because I was far away, but um, seeing the power of prayer when everybody stopped in the nation. 
stopped on the side of the roads, got out their cars and prayed. And I, I witnessed a miracle that happened is that it was that unity, that unity that brought everyone together at the at the 11th hour, the hour of need and the hour of Hosanna, Hosanna. Crying out, deliver us, save us. Maybe that's an opportunity for us to hold on to this week. Appreciating what he did on the cross so many years ago. But as he was entering Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin challenged uh, Jesus and he answered by parables. And, you know, the final journey wasn't one that was easy. And it was this mounting conflict that was happening on the route to what the Father had called him to do. But his authority was questioned. And in Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through to 27, it reads, Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing. Which of you tell me? I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. The authority that he had in his father, Father God, the Son, and then later to come the Holy Spirit. But I want to focus in on a word wealth for today. And it's an invite. It's an opportunity. Baptism. Strong's Accordance 908. From the word baptizo, to dip, to immerse. And baptisma emphasizes the result of the act rather than the act itself. In Christian baptism, the stress is on the baptized person's identification with Christ in death, in burial, and in resurrection. The word describes the experience of a, coven, a, covert, uh, sorry, of a convert from initial acceptance of Christ to initiation into the Christian community. So countering, uh, countering his own question, he put forward to his opponents upon the thorns of a dilemma, by asking Jesus the authority for his actions. The religious authorities hoped to trap him in a statement of blasphemy. Mark chapter 11, verses 27 Sorry, Mark chapter 11, verses 27 through to 12, verses 2. It's quite a long passage of scripture. Because when he was talking about the ministry of Jesus and the ministry in Jerusalem, as well as the stories of all that came before and after him. Mark chapter 11 verses 27 through to 12 verses 2. Gives us a wonderful answer. Then they came to him again in Jerusalem. And, and as he was walking in the temple. The chief priests and scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them. I will ask you one question. And then answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. And again, he answered, he asked them, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, and they fear the people, for all counts of John have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said, we do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, Neither will I tell you by which authority I do these things. We have faith. We have faith in him. And the reason why I mention it twice is the double emphasis of his authority. 
his authority that was questioned and he gave them the answer. And when we have authority in Christ, we can stand with uh, victorious belief in warfare that happens during our lives and during seasons. And when we speak to these mountains and we say, move from here to there, we stand in authority. We stand in authority and we exercise and we apply our given God-given ability and responsibility for the pathway of miracles as well as the uh, faith during warfare that we bring in unity. I shared with some money uh, a while ago a passage of scripture which re refers to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Speaks of the diversity but in unity. Maybe something worth reading. But then it goes on to talk about the parable of the wicked vine dresser. In verses 1, it says, Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and went into the far country. Now, at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers and he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vin vine dresser. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. And again he sent another servant. At him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to the last, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said amongst themselves, This is the here. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. I want to repeat a, a, a passage of scripture. Have you not even read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Sure, talk about controversial stories, eh? But with his uh, authority that was questioned... He gave them the answer that they needed to hear. Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And the, and, and the wicked uh, vine dressers, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Let's turn our attention to another passage of scripture which happened in this time. And it's speaking of the tribute to Caesar. Happened in Jerusalem. And if we go back to Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him with his talk. And they sent him to their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true. Teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of man. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And then they said to him, Whose image is inscrip and inscription is this? Then they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they were marveled and left him and went their way. To render is Strong's Accordance 591, to fulfill one's duty to someone. Give what is due, give back, recompense and restore. Let's have a look at a couple of notes that I've made here. Because Jesus' popularity, the religious authorities wanted first to entrap and discredit him amongst the people in order to justify his death. If Jesus answered yes, he would lose favor with the people who hated Roman domin uh, domination. 
If he answered no, his enemies would report him to the Roman authorities as a traitor. Their very possession of a Roman coin evidenced their subservience to the Roman rule. The earthly state provides for the welfare of its citizens and they were obligated to support the government. But as children of God, for the kingdom of God, we owe our allegiance to God. We are citizens of another kingdom. And when it comes to things that may cause some division, which is unfortunate because we labor and strive and pray that there will be harmony between the sacred and the secular, but as we're going to learn, if there's things that are not of God, we are to obey God. As mentioned, there shouldn't be any conflict between the two kingdoms. But our loyalty and allegiance to God takes precedence. Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through to 17, speaks of the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And I'll let you read that so that you can look at it from Mark's point of view. Luke chapter 20, verses 20 to 26, also speaks of these accounts. And again, I'll let you read them because it's very similar in uh, the teaching. I want to turn our attention to something that also happened as they crossed over the Jordan. And as mentioned yesterday, was the crossing of the people of God into the promised land. Which, as mentioned, included Israelites. It could have included many others. But they were in harmony. They were in unity. And they were following the voice of the Lord and the providence of the Lord and the presence of the Lord. And that's why when they touched that water, that Jordan River, had parted and they went through. But when they got to the other side, there was great celebration because they had been victorious in what God had led them through. Not only for the 400 years uh, in, in slavery and captivity, but the 40 years in the wilderness, and it was something to be celebrated. And in chapter 4, it uh, gives us a great account of how the memorial stones were uh, celebrated and, and uh, put in place. And I'll read the first few verses to encourage you to read the rest of chapter 4. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan and the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe, Joshua, saying to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign amongst you when your children ask in a time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them and say that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to place them where they had lodged, and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the ark of the covenant stood. And there they are to this day. And then I'll let you continue reading the, the rest of it. But ending off on verses 24, 
23 and 24. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan River before you until you had crossed over. And as the Lord your God did so in the Red Sea, which he dried up before you until we had crossed over, that all peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Now the hand, the hand of the Lord was with them. Word wealth and Strong's Accordance 3027 is the hand that means by which work is accomplished, strengthened with power. This noun occurs more than 1,500 times in the Old Testament and is found in a great number of figures of speech. For instance, to be given into the hands of someone denotes coming under his authority, being rescued out of the hands of someone, is descriptive of deliverance and freedom. Our high hand may describe either haughtiness or triumphal rejoicing. One interesting derivative of this noun is the verb yada generally translated to thank or to praise. Its original meaning was probably to praise by lifting up the hands. We lift up our hands and we say yada. We worship, we thank him when he delivers us and brings us into the freedom as it was. But then in chapter 5, it went and spoke about the second generation that was circumcised. And this happened as they crossed over the Jordan 1273 B.C., and I'll let you read the whole of chapter 5, which goes into this through the scriptural um, uh, uh, writings in the book of Joshua. But I just want to say that uh, the notes that I've made is uh, from learning, from studying myself, is that uh, following the Jewish nation's crossing of the Jordan into the land of Canaan, which was the day before Nisan 10, and then preparation for bringing of the Passover offering, the men were circumcised under the guidance of Joshua. Now, due to the weather conditions in the desert, which were not conducive for the healing of wounds during the wilderness period of 40 years in the desert sojourn, only the tribe of Levi was circumcised and their sons. And you can, as I said, find reading on this in Joshua chapter 5. But then there was another thing. It was that Brit the Brit Miller, the covenant of circumcision, going into the covenantal relationship. Covenant relationship given by God to Abraham, circumcision being the first commandment given to Abraham by God, being the first Jew, and being central to Judaism. But there was a contrast. There was a contrast between both Ishmael as well as Isaac. We're going to learn a little uh, about that in a second. But I want to turn our attention to Genesis chapter 17. From 7 to 27. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you your descendants after you in the land in which you are a stranger all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you, and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And then I'll let you continue reading the significance of circumcision through the rest of the accounts, but I want to touch on two things. Number one, a word wealth, which is covenant. And Strong's Accordance 1285 is a covenant, a compact, a pledge, a treaty, or an agreement. This is one of the most theologically important words in the Bible, appearing more than 250 times in the Old Testament. A beret may be made between individuals, between a king and his people, or by God and his people. Here, God's irrevocable pledge is that he will be God to Abraham and his descendants forever. The greatest provision of the Abrahamic covenant. This is the foundation stone of Israel's eternal relationship with God. A true and affirm, affirmed by David, by, by the Lord himself and by Paul. All other biblical promises are based on this one. Further reading can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 24 
Jeremiah chapter 33 verses 24 to 26 and Romans chapter 9 verses 4 chapter 11 verses 2 and 29. But what's the significance of the circumcision? It's the blood, isn't it? Even in the Old Testament, all the way back in Genesis, when, the, when some of the patriarchs only believed in the first five books of uh, the uh, Bible. The act of circumcision was required as a sign of a covenant previously established with Abraham. This was not a new covenant, but an external sign that Abraham and his descendants were to execute, to shadow that they were God's covenantal people. The fact that this was performed upon the male reproductive organ had at least a twofold significance. The cutting away of a foreskin spoke of the cutting away of flesh, fleshly dependence, and their hope for the future prosperity and prosperity was not to rest upon their own ability. Circumcision was a statement that confidence was being placed in the promise of God and his faithfulness rather than in their own flesh. Now, this could be quite a debatable subject, so I won't spend too much time on it. But there's the circumcision, as we've discussed right here. But then there's also the circumcision of the heart, because you can have the circumcision of the flesh. But if your heart's not right with the Lord, it means nothing. So until you have the circumcision of the heart, the rest is meaningless. But it's even more important to appreciate that this Abrahamic covenant was one that would allow us to have our dependency, not in our own fleshly ability, but in the providence, in the good nature and pleasing will of our Heavenly Father. Let's just go back to Luke chapter 20. I know we're going on a wonderful journey through the accounts of the, the Scripture. I did want to read something to you, but if I find it, I will put it in the comment section below because it's quite important speaking of the words we speak. Um, and perhaps maybe it will come to me just now, but right now I don't have it with me. But it also, oh, here we go, it's right here. Power and promise of, uh, promises of God's word. One of the explicit teachings of the Bible is the importance of the words we speak. In this text, God changes Abram's name to Abraham and promises Abraham that he will become a father of many nations. And Abram means high father or patriarch. And Abraham means father of the multitude. Thus, God was arranging that every time Abraham heard or spoke his own name, he would be reminded of God's promise. Adam Clark's commentary states it well. God associates the patriarch more nearly to himself, by this imparting to him a portion of his own name, noting God added to this Abraham for the sake of dignity. The principle let God's words, which designated his will and promise for your life, become as fixed in your mind as a, as a governing of your speech, as God's changing Abraham's name was in shaping his concept of himself. Do not name yourself anything less than what God does. Beautiful kingdom dynamic for us to appreciate. So I asked the question about a couple of things, but before we go into the Ishmael and Isaac uh, situation, God told Abraham that he would in one year be a father with Sarah, and his name will be Isaac. Abraham was about 99 and Sarah about 90 years old, and they were childless for 75 years. They, they, were a, they were a married couple, but they were a married childless couple for 75 years. And Sarah was physically incapable of having children. Abraham already having a son, Ishmael, born 13 years earlier. Sarah, Sarah actually urged him to marry her, and her name was Hagar. And he had a son with Hagar, and he was a father to Ishmael. And Abraham's reaction to the divine promise that he was given was to proclaim, only if Ishmael would live before you, suggesting him to be perfect, to be perfectly happy, to see Ishmael as his here. 
But God actually rejected Abraham's proposal, but reassured him that Ishmael would be looked after and would become a great people. But he said, my covenant I shall establish with Isaac. Isaac would father the people with whom I will enter into a covenant as my kingdom of priests and holy nation, said the Lord. Now, what is this uh, situation with Ishmael and Isaac? And it's caused so much division, so much concern, and so much strife and uh, falling short on both sides. Ishmael and Isaac were significant in their own respects. And while God said that Ishmael would be looked after and be, you know, have uh, become a great people, he did say that his covenant would be with Isaac. Ishmael came into this world by natural means, but Isaac's was a supernatural event. It was a message given to both of them, with even their names being changed. Ishmael was circumcised at the age of 13 when Abraham fulfilled the promise, even with his 13-year-old son, at the age of awareness, one would say. But Isaac, he entered the covenantal relationship of circumcision as an eight-day-old infant, just like Jesus was. At the age when perhaps maybe they don't reason or may be aware of the significance of this covenantal External sign. But remember we spoke about baptism. That's the external commitment for your inward renewal. When your heart has been circumcised. Ishmael represents a rational relationship with God based upon a person's nature. As well as the understanding. But Isaac... Isaac represents a supernatural, super-rational bond between God and him. And those that are committed to a, re a relationship, intimate relationship, not religion, but relationship with God, will transcend both the natural as well as the rational, because he takes us higher. So I just want to say in this... Uh, point that we see that there's a lot of hostility, there's a lot of uh, anger, there's a lot of retaliation that happens during a season such as this. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Jesus comes from the line through David as we're going to learn shortly. But even in the account of Jesus when he was going into his final week of, work, of his ministry work, the Sadducees questioned the resurrection. If we go back to Matthew chapter 22 verses 23 to 33. The same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children... His brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after having married and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also and the third even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they are all had her. And Jesus answered and said to him, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they are neither marry nor given in marriage, but they are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. This hypothetical case Stated by the Sadducees was based on Deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 5 to 10. And I think for time's sake, for time keeping, keeping sake, we're going to 
allow you to read that in your own time. But the ludicrous uh, statement of the denial of the resurrection can be found in this passage. The erroneous thinking, the erroneous way of uh, thinking that heaven can be attained in terms of earthly terms. Life in heaven will be an extension and even a supernatural elevation from the temporal existence that we currently face in, in this world. The God, the, the power of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob will provide for a new and greater relationship that transcends all the physical relationships of this present age. And as mentioned before, the patriarchs as well as the Sadducees accepted only the first five books of the Old Testament as scripture, re rejected the resurrection because they saw nothing in their scriptures to support their, their doctrine, doctrine of man. But Jesus pointed out that even when God spoke the words of Exodus chapter 3 verses 6, Christ was there. Exodus chapter 3 verses 6 allows us to read. I'll go a little bit earlier. Then he, uh, from verses 5. Then the Lord said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. We're going to touch on a very important historical message here. It's talking about angels. One, usually, one usual angel, the angel of the Lord, is different from all other angels receiving worship. How could this be? No angel can receive worship, which belongs to God alone. The angel Lucifer was expelled from heaven for trying to receive such worship. The mystery is solved in this text where the angel of the Lord is revealed to be the Lord God. But how could Moses and other Old Testament persons have seen God face to face and lived in Scripture since clearly Scripture states the contrary? The answer, because they saw the Son of God in pre-incarnation form, known in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, the messenger, the angel of the covenant. Sometimes there's angels that brings us messages in a time of need, whether it be the 11th hour or whether it be guiding you into your full eternal inheritance, divine destiny. But when the Lord said, I know their sorrows, Strong's Accordance 3045 is, says to know, to perceive, to distinguish, to recognize, to acknowledge, to be acquainted with. In few instances, to know intimately, that is, sexually also, to acknowledge, recognize, esteem and endorse. When scripture speaks of God's making known his name, it refers to his revealing through deeds and events what his name truly means. Thus, in chapter 6, verses 3, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob as El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahweh, I was not, not known by them. God did not mean that the patriarchs had never heard the name Yahweh, but rather that he did not reveal the full meaning of his name Yahweh until the time of Moses and the Exodus. El Shaddai. There's a message for a few people out there. <laughs> so this event of Moses at the burning bush clearly did, uh, uh, confirmed that the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had been physically dead not God, but Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had been dead for many, many years. So evidently there is life after death. And Mark chapter 12, verses 18 to 27, speaks of the same thing, the Sadducees. What about the resurrection? He is the God, not of the dead, but the God of the living. Therefore the Sadducees were greatly mistaken. Even in Luke, 
the great physician. Not the greatest, but the great one. Luke chapter 20, verses 27 to 40. For all live to him, and counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead. Let's keep in mind that he's coming back for the bride. He's, he's coming back for that marriage supper. Are we ready? Are we, have we got our, our, our lamps full, as with the, the virgins? Just try and picture something as a, um, an appreciation. If your petrol tank is half empty, you're not going to go as far as if it is when it's full. And if it runs out on the side of a highway, you need to go and get some petrol yourself or get someone to bring petrol for you to fill it up so you could continue your journey. This is the same situation as it was with the, with the virgins and their, their, their oil lamps. Are our oil lamps ready for his return? So the Pharisees also question the commandments in Jerusalem. And we go back to Matthew, spending a bit, a bit, a bit of time in Matthew today. But when the Pharisees, taking it from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40, but uh, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answered and said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. To me, that's an important one for me. That's an important one for me because it's the truth and I shared it with somebody and still do share it with people like yourself that I love. Um, but it's that growth in love, isn't it? It's the growth in love that allows us to grow into the kingdom that he has called us to. One of the greatest indicators that we are growing in our relationship with God is found in our willingness to love. God is love. Love is not just something that he does. It is what he is. It follows then that we are never more godly, never more like God than we can love. How easily we make look at these two commandments and say quickly, I love the Lord, yet struggle with loving our neighbor. And Jesus makes the second commandment as important as the first. We cannot fulfill the first commandment to love God with out obeying the second commandment to love our neighbor, as found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20. Nor can we avoid this problem by narrowing our definition of neighbor to people in our own neighborhood. That is, to those of our family, our race, our perspective, economic or intellectual level, or value system, or even just the religion. In the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verses 29 to 37, Jesus makes the world my neighbor by qualifying anyone God puts in my path or who needs me as my neighbor. My prayer is that those that have ears to hear that divine message will hold on to that as truth. Spoken by the Lord himself and through those that love him. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Let me go back to Mark. Mark chapter, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. It goes on to say the same thing as what we've just read, but a word wealth mind comes into play here, where he says, You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Strong's Accordance 1271, literally a thinking through, a dynoia is combined, nous, which is mind, and dia, which is through. The word suggests understanding, insight, meditation, reflection, perception, 
the gift of apprehension and the faculty of thought. When this utterly is renewed by the Holy Spirit, the whole mindset changes from the fearful negativism of the carnal mind to the vibrant positive thinking of the quickened spiritual mind. Hmm. We're going to be going a little bit overboard today, but it's worth it. There's two. There's a twofold commandment that was happening. The scribes not only agreed with Jesus, but uh, placed this twofold love commandment above the whole of the Jewish religion. It's not about religion; it's about relationship. Let's look at Jesus and David. Going back to Matthew chapter 22. From 41 through to 46. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him one word, nor from that day on did anyone query or dare to question him any more. Jesus seized the moment. The moment of offence with the countering question concerning the person of Jesus Christ. The favourite messianic term or title given by the Jews was the son of David. Interpreted in highly uh, nationalistic and revolutionary terms, which uh, is very dear to a lot of people, especially the Jewish people. King David, great man, man after God's own heart. But Jesus quoted Psalms 110 verses 1, recognized by the Jews as one of the greatest messianic psalms, which asserts not only his humanity, but his deity. Does the father call his son Lord? No, it's in reverse. It's in reverse. The son calls his father Lord. Therefore, the Lord God said to my Lord, the Messiah, how can the Messiah be the son of David? Thus these titles, the son of David, is inadequate. But to be sure, Jesus Christ is the son of David, but is no less that he is the son of God. So we go back to Mark chapter 12. We're going between Matthew and Mark quite a lot today, which is great. It's awesome. And then it also speaks of these scriptural messages. But I just want to reiterate. For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And in Luke chapter 20 verses 41 to 44, Mentions the same, but goes in to say, Therefore David calls him Lord. And how is he then? His son. It's something to not only get our minds around or through or upon, but by the Holy Spirit he'll reveal it to you. Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 40, gives us a bit of a Bit of a, a warning. Beware of the scribes. And he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, but who devour widows' houses, for the pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Reminds me of the widow, the widow's two mites. 
the widow's two mites. Following on in verses 41, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people have put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quandron. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all of those who had given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of the poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. I've been in situations where I've not known where, where the next meal would come from and how I'd pay the next um, bill. But you be faithful. You tithe. Even if it's a cent. It's giving into the house of the Lord and allowing him to do what he wants to do. But it's that step of faith. It says, show me, test me on this. The sincere devotion of the poor widow was in sharp contrast to the shame of the righteousness of the scribes. The treasury was located in the court of women, or the jar, treasury or the jar, <laughs> referring to the offerings that were placed in the chests, the 13 chests shaped like trumpets. And the rich people called attention to themselves and their gifts as they put it in drawing attention to themselves. But the important message here, and the important thing for Jesus is not the amount, but the commitment and the sacrifice that it represents. Luke chapter 21 verses 1 to 4 speaks of the same thing. And the mite was the smallest coin circulating in Palestine area worth about an eighth of a cent in the day and for the benefit of his roman readers mark explained their value in roman coinage we're going to close off on a couple of verses romans chapter 13 verses 1 to 7 let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities, resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will be, bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's ministers for your good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is, a God, he, is, he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but because of conscience sake. Because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore all the Jews, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs on whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Now as I read that, I, I uh, am obedient in reading that passage because it was what I was led to by the Lord. And as I was going through that reading and just appreciating the, the truths of it and uh, being conflicted with the current situation in our land and across the world about how there's good and evil at play, if the authorities are existent because of the appointment by God, I want to leave a couple of verses for you to read. In Daniel chapter 4 verses 32 and Psalms chapter 75 verses 6 to 7. Paul doesn't suggest that God approves of corrupt governments, ungodly officials or unjust legislation. God allows to have evil rulers in place for a time and a season, as the Old Testament prophets frequently testified. But ideally, God grants authority to serve good ends. And how that authority is exercised will be the accounting of each whom to it is being given. 
Authority, obedience is the general rule. However, there's a clear biblical principle to disobey government if commanded to sin. Loyalty to God always takes priority over all human authority. Passages of scripture to reference this is Esther chapter 4 verses 16, Daniel chapter 3 verses 12 to 18, and Daniel chapter 6 verses 10, Matthew chapter 2 verses 12, Acts chapter 5 verses 29, and Hebrews chapter 11 verses 23. I'm not ending this short. This needs to be said. When government officials use force to restrain and punish evil, they are not doing wrong. Rather, they are God's ministers and servants, and they are doing good. Therefore, Christians may serve as officers and those with a good conscience. To bear the sword is to carry and use weapons, and this implies right to carry out the punishment or wrongdoings. For swords were used to take people's lives. The fact that God authorizes governments as his servants to use force even to the point of taking human life does not contradict the command, you shall not murder, in Exodus chapter 20 verses 13. The word used in that commandment refers to criminal murder and does not include judicial taking of life or killing in war. For which the Old Testament uses other words, the same is true of the Greek word translated kill or murder in such New Testament passages as found in Matthew chapter 5 verses 21. To execute wrath, sometimes God's wrath is carried out through civil government when it punishes wrongdoers. This means that civil punishment should not only be imposed for the purpose of restraining evil, but also for the purpose of retribution. Paul gives two reasons why Christians must obey government. Number one, because of wrath, that is to avoid the punishment that government executes on those who do wrong. And for conscience sake, that is, because we want to keep a clear conscience before God, who has established government and commands us to obey it. The second reason means that even where there is no likelihood of arrest or punishment, Christians should be fully obedient to the government. Both Paul and Jesus directs Christians to pay taxes to the Roman government, which was certainly not pure or righteous in all its actions. As with all commandments of God, we should try to obey this one joyfully, not grudgingly. Whenever we tend to become discouraged with the imperfections of our government or the burden of taxation that it imposes on us, we would do well to remember that the alternative, anarchy, is far worse. Having said that, when there's legislation that can be changed at the 11th hour to set the captives free, we stand on what Jesus has called us to do. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, set the captives free. Freely receive, freely give. This is the gospel. Acts chapter 4 verses 18 through to 20 speaks of another account of where the name of Jesus was forbidden. In chapter 4, verses 18 to 20, it says, So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. The superseding obedience to God in instances where the human authority resists his will is modeled in this passage. There are no grounds in this text for the toleration of a demonic spirit or evil agenda. And Peter and John's demeanor asserting the higher moral claim does not manifest either arrogance or presumption. So as we finish off today reading the word of God and taking it from scripture, I share this out of love, out of compassion, and out of sincerity in this time of history that we're living in. Turning our hearts and our minds and our lives back to Jesus. 
accepting and realizing the good and pleasing will of our Heavenly Father because He's a good, good Father. But as with the pending judgment, as was written all through the Old Testament as well as the New, He's coming back for His bride and we need to be ready. If those in authority that are uh, agreeing with or partnering with evil agendas, we know where our loyalty stands. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. We follow you. We adore you. We grow in you. This is what it's about. It's about your kingdom coming. And it's about the eternal kingdom having supremacy over the evil agenda and the wicked one. Lord, we come before you. We bow our knees. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you, Jesus Christ, are Lord. And we come against the wicked one. We come against the evil agenda and we ask you, Lord, as it was in your word, send forth those that are able to bring about the good restorative plan that you have put on their hearts. Not for their glory, but for your glory alone. We pray that the children, your little children, come into your presence without being hindered. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and thank you for the life of your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is a longer one, quite a lot overdue, but there was a lot that we packed into that session. And I'd really encourage you to just take some time out and just spend a little bit of time with the Lord and just go through them. Even if you have to press pause and have a look at all the verses that I've encouraged you to read so that we can continue growing, continue standing on the rock and allowing him to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Remember, the stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone.